for the 10 people that are excited. Thank you for coming. And may God multiply blessings in your life. For everybody else, live. No, no, I'm joking. Um, wake up. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, uh, there's a word from the Lord. Anybody excited about it? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Uh, we're in a series, Honoring God with Your M&M. Honoring God with Your M&M. Uh, so we're talking about honoring God with your mind, honoring God with your money, honoring God with your mouth, honoring God with your minutes. Now, I know some of you all may already be looking at your calendar and you say, man, next Sunday is the Sunday before Thanksgiving. And they're talking about honoring God with my mouth. Man, they done messed up my whole Thanksgiving holiday. Don't, don't. Still come to church next Sunday. It's going to help you. It's going to help you not gain the Thanksgiving 30. Amen. I just made the Thanksgiving 30 up. But some of us, you know, it, it happens. I walk past food and gain weight. Anyway. And so, so we talk about honoring God with your mind, your mouth, your mind, your money, your mouth, and your minutes. It's a stewardship series, and it helps us live a holistic life. Uh, and so I'm reminded in First John, I mean, Third John chapter 1, um, the apostle, he said, I pray that you, uh, that you all prosper, that you would prosper in every way and be in good health just as your whole life is going well. So our hope is that we will be able to position ourselves for biblical prosperity in every area of our lives. Amen? Amen? Understand prosperity is not a curse word. Amen? So we want to position ourselves for biblical prosperity in every area of our life. So today, we're talking about honoring God with our money. Everybody say money, 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 money. Well, I like that falsetto right there. I think I might be able to get a song one day. But, um, but so today, we're talking about money. Uh, everybody shout money. Money. I know, I know some of y'all already kind of, ah, don't worry, I'm going to help you. Uh, as we talk about this subject, I think it's a, I think it's a great subject today. I, will, I want to endeavor to help us to be faith-filled and faithful in regards to finances in our lives. Amen. And so we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And we're going to start at verse 6. Uh, and we're going to read to uh, verse, uh, verse 10. 6 through 10. I changed it up a little bit, so it might be an extra verse up there. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 through 10. Uh, actually, verse 11, too. <laughs> so, uh, we know participation is better than? Let us rise to our feet as we read the word of God. Reading out of the Christian Standard Bible. And it reads, it says, the point is this. The person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the person who sows generously will also reap generously. Each person should do as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or out of compulsion, since God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make every grace overflow to you, so that in every way, always having everything you need, you may excel in every good work. As it is written, he distributed freely, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now the one who provides seed for the sower and bread for food will also provide and multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for all generosity which produces thanksgiving to God through us. Let's go to verse 15 real quick. Verse 15, I want to make sure I, I read this part uh, as well. Uh, and it says, just verse 15, it says, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Let's go back to, uh, to, verse, to verse 7. Verse 7, and it says, God loves a what kind of giver? Cheerful. God loves a cheerful giver. A cheerful giver. Now, understand the subject is honoring God with your money uh, for a title and kind of like a catchphrase. Uh, it's going to be a little bit of improper English, but hopefully you'll follow me. I love being in a multi-ethnic setting. Here we go. Are y'all ready? Are y'all ready? I want you to look at your neighbor, look at your neighbor, and say, get your money right. <laughs> look, at the next, look, at that, look at somebody else say, get your money right. All right, all right, all right, all right. Yeah, you may be seated. And so our sermon title today is When I Get My Money Right. When I get, now, but without, without me giving any uh, cultural uh, contextualization to that phrase, does anybody know what I'm talking about when I say get your money right? If you do, can you just raise your hand? Thank you. I see a couple folks. That's fine. That's fine. See, the beauty of being in a multi-ethnic church, we get to exchange cultures. And part of culture is colloquialisms and language. 
And so when we say get your money right, that means so much. That means I will have enough. That means it will be in order. My ducks will be in a row. Amen. Uh, and so I want to propose to you that your money will never be right until you honor God with it. Amen. And so in order for us to do this, we're going to look at a biblical understanding of what money is. And here's my point today. Money is a servant. Money is a seed. But money is not the source. That, that, I thought that was good. Money is a servant. Amen. Money is a seed. But it's not the source. And with that, we're going to endeavor so that we can move into a place of prospering in the way God has designed for us. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity, Lord, to cover this subject. And Lord, our heart is to honor you. Lord God, we want to learn what it means. And God, we want to do it wholeheartedly in every area of our lives. And Lord, specifically today, I believe there's a word for your people. And so God, we ask that you would feed us. Bless this spiritual meal, Lord, that we might sup from the bread of heaven, your word, and we might be fulfilled, satisfied with you and then overflowing to the world around us. God, even as I preach, Lord, I pray now, Lord, let your anointing be fresh. Lord, anoint me afresh from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. May the words in my mouth and the meditations in my heart be acceptable in thy sight. God, do a work in this place that at the end of this service, that we will all agree that God did it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Honoring God with your money. Now, as we talk about honoring God with your money, um, I, I know uh, this is kind of pulling the crowd. When how many of us, you know, when you hear the subject of money comes up, we kind of eh, eh, like not really like anxious, but you know, eh, uh, anybody you can just just bear with me. Yeah, uh, okay, three people, five, six, seven. Good. Uh, how many of us when you hear about money in church, it's almost like uh, you know, anybody? Come on, you're not gonna get the promise. You will not get kicked out. Amen. Go ahead, you raise your hand, right? Uh, how many of us have heard the subject of money um, talked about wrong in church? Raise your hand, yeah. Have seen it, yeah. yeah. I can raise my hand to all of those. As a matter of fact, due to the wrong ways it's been displayed, I want to apologize on behalf of the body of Christ. Uh, and also, that, helped, that had to work through me, too, because what I recognize, a misunderstanding of money is a misunderstanding of God. And, and what has happened in our society is that money has been ascribed a God-like value. And money was never designed to have a God-like place. That's good already. Money was never, money has been ascribed a God-like value, but it was never designed to be in a God-like place. Have you ever noticed that most of the idols that exist in our life, idols are things that we worship instead of the true and living God. Most of the idols that we worship in our life are things that God gave us, and then we took the thing that he gave us and put it over the giver. Yeah. See, here's the thing with the conversation about money. I mean, come on. Like, I, 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 like you can mess with a lot of stuff in somebody's life, but don't mess with their money. Like, here, here's the thing. I, I, and this, this, this just dawned on me, right? This just dawned on me, Chris Jones. I was thinking, isn't it interesting that we would trust people with people we care about more than we're trusting with our money? Yeah. So here's the thing. I'll let somebody watch my kid that I won't let have my debit card. Y'all, y'all not here. Y'all, because... What ha- what is, I'm, I'm trying to put this in perspective because oftentimes you don't know how much you value it until somebody else got their hands on it. <laughs> and so this is why when I start talking about money, everybody, <laughs> because there's a few things people don't like you to talk about unless you're giving them a compliment, their money and their body. Amen. Don't talk, don't you ever say, I look chubby, frumpy, or ugly. Don't talk about it, but say, oh, you look good. Did you lose weight? Talk about it all you want. Come on. Don't say, oh, you broke. No, don't you talk about my money. Even I am broke. It ain't for you to say. But it's like, oh, yo, you, you, you balling for real. <laughs> yeah, boy. Mickey <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what just happened. Um, <laughs> it's just something. <laughs> that other Chris came. <laughs> the, the <laughs> Bob came out here. And so, and, and, and so but, but here's the interesting thing. That money has been such an influence on humanity that it has required psychologists to study our brain. To the point where they would say the exchange of money in our lives connects with the part of our brain where anxiety, pain, and joy also connect. 
So even though it's external, it begins to affect the chemical balance in our brains. And, and even when you, how many of us ever spent money that you had or maybe you didn't have? How many of us spent money, right, and, and, and you were excited about what you purchased, right? Like how many of us, now listen, how many of us know that retail therapy is like a real strong thing? It's a real stronghold. Retail therapy works. Like, sometimes, you know, some people might go outside and they might be like, you know, they might pack their cigarettes and smoke a cool or something like that, right? And, and, but some of us, we just like, you know, you know, like to go, go to Tajay and get a couple things. They stress me at work, bump this, I'm leaving this meeting, go to Walmart. <laughs> people up in H&M just buying skinny clothes. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so... <laughs> Because what happens when we spend money, it lights up this thing in our brain. Ding, 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 ding. And it begins to sing, send dopamine and adrenaline through our body. Dopamine in our brains give us the, the good feeling and then the adrenaline comes and you begin to feel good. It gives you a rush to the point where, as psychologists continue to study, that a brain active around money looks like a brain active on cocaine. <laughs> That's, see, if you notice... People who are addicted don't necessarily want to be addicted, and they keep on using even when it hurts. <laughs> some of y'all going to get it. And say, I'll try to let you get it before I said it. This is why some of y'all spending money that you don't want to spend, and it hurts you because you're addicted to it. You're trying to stop, but your brain is saying, cocaine. You thought it was saying Andrew Jackson. You thought it was saying about all about the Benjamins. No, it's saying cocaine. Like it's addictive. And so you're addicted to the swipe. Swiper, stop swiping. Come on, come on. I'm going to get, listen, I'm going to get in this room, okay, right? And so, and so, when you, so when you look at the idea around money, the, I remember, now, see, there was an anxiety around money for me. And here's the thing, because it's not that I didn't have, I, I, didn't, have a, I didn't have some. I always never felt like I had enough. One person asked Mr. Rockefeller, I'm talking about the old Rockefeller, not Jay-Z, uh, uh, talking about, they, they asked Mr. Rockefeller, they said, how much money does it take to satisfy a person? He responded, it's never enough. Because if you look at money alone to satisfy, it's never enough. Some of us can look at where you are right now and you're making more money than you ever made and broke as ever. Ooh, shots fired. You're trying to duck and dodge. Got you by your bank account. What you going to do? <laughs> <Nah>. <laughs> Some of us in here trying to erase our credit score right now. We done signed our credit score to a scripture. Lord, help me. Now, anyway. Uh, <laughs> and, so, and so the thing is, what, what it is, money was never meant to fully satisfy. Now, let, 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 me, let, me, let, me, just, let me throw this out here to you. Uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, it says, uh, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways, and he would direct your path. How many of us heard that scripture before? Heard of it? Heard the iteration of it? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways, and he would direct your paths, right? And so when we get into this whole thing, trust in the Lord with all your heart, I think it's cool that when Solomon was dropping wisdom there, that Jesus reiterated, uh, Jesus, Jesus reiterated in the greatest commandment. And so he says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. When they ask Jesus what's the greatest command, he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, right? Lean not into your own understanding. Love him with all your mind. You all see the parallel. And then it says, and then he would direct your paths. And then so it says, love him with all your strength. And so it's talking about your efforts in life. And so when you look at what was said in Proverbs 3 and what Jesus said in the greatest commandment, he's saying this, that until you have given the Lord your heart, it's difficult to give him anything else. Whew, that was worth writing down, tweeting, snapchatting. That was worth telling your enemy. Until you have given God your heart, it's going to be difficult to give him anything else. Ah, oh, I let that rest on you. Because here's the thing. If you haven't given him, the thing is, your, your, your possessions, your body, and all your priorities follow your heart. The problem is, if you put your heart in the wrong place, all of that's going to follow as well. Oh, yeah, I'm about to, whoo. Some of, some of us are mad about the people we done laid down with. We gave our heart to somebody and our body followed. See, here's the thing. You will give your body. That's a whole nother. I'm going to teach that next stewardship series. 
uh, it's going to be about five B's, and body's going to be one of them. Right? Anyway, you give your body to what your heart has been given to, which is why Romans chapter 12 says the spiritual act of worship, of symbolizing that you are giving God your heart, is presenting your body. So until you're giving God your heart, you won't, it'll be, you, you'll struggle giving him anything else. And so, furthermore, let me continue to prove this in Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3 continues to go. So Proverbs 3, 5 is trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not into your own understanding, acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will direct your paths, right? But then you drop down to Proverbs 3, 9. It says, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first produce of your entire harvest. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and now let me give you some instructions. If you trust in him with all your heart, honor him with all of your possessions and the first fruits of your produce. Everybody say, God first. And so when you look at this moment in Proverbs 3, 9, he's saying, the way I know that you're honoring God with your heart is how you honor him with your possessions. Let me suggest to you, a closed wallet to God is a sign of a closed heart to God. Why? Because Jesus also said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Some of us are willing to give God everything except for our money. Pin drop. I expected that pin drop, though. Because the idea of honoring the Lord with our possessions and the first fruit of our increase, it begins to be a little bit foreign when the world says that the money was for you. See, the difference between tithers and non-tithers, tithers who give 10% of their increase, 10% of their finances, you, I, I, I just stumbled across this. We don't look at it when you tithe. You should look at it like, oh, I'm giving 10%. When you tithe, you should look at it like I'm receiving 90%. Just flip that upside down. Bow! Right? Did, did, I know y'all heard me. I heard y'all. Do y'all understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? The, see, here's the thing. When people have an issue with the rules, it most likely means they have an issue with the ruler. Ha! But if I already given him my heart, that means I recognize I only give because I already receive. Uh, you know, y- y'all still ain't got it. Let me get in the Bible. One of the promises in Ezekiel 37, when the valley of dry bones was living, he told them, I will give you a new heart. And so because he gave me a new heart, I'm trying to give it back to him. And the way I'm giving it back to him is honoring him with everything I got. Everything I got, I want to honor God with it. So here's the thing. When you honor God with your heart, when you get your money right, when you honor him with your money, you would give cigs. Now, I'm not talking about cigarettes. I know some of y'all start thinking about Winston's, Virginia Slims, Cools, Newport, and, and all of that, right? Some of y'all might have a nicotine patch on right now. Like, no, why are you talking about that, man? I just started vaping, dude. Like, <laughs> six. Everybody say six. I love acronyms. And so as I was looking at this, when you honor God with your heart, you will give cheerfully, you will give intentionally, you will give generously, and you will give sacrificially. I think that's worth rehearsing. When you honor God with your finances, when you honor God with your money, when you honor God with your possessions, you will recognize you will give cheerfully, you will give intentionally, you will make plans behind it. You will have joy in giving, and you will give generously. You won't just give a little bit, you'll try to give a lot of bit. Everybody say a lot of bit. You'll try to give a lot of it. And then not only that, you'll also give sacrificially. Even when it doesn't feel as comfortable, you'll recognize it's worth the sacrifice. When you honor God with your finances, you will give cheerfully, intentionally, generously, and sacrificially. Now, let me dig into this just a little bit more. Let me give you a little bit of context to why Paul was writing what he was writing in 2 Corinthians in the text that we read. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, he, 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 says, he, says, he says specifically, he says, let me write to you, I shouldn't have to, about the ministry of giving. That's what he says. He says, I really don't need to write to you about this ministry of giving. Ministry of giving. Ministry of of giving. Let me talk to some church folk just for a second. When most people say I'm called to ministry, they don't say I'm called to giving. They feel like they're called to a platform. But when I see here, Paul says, you're not called to a platform, you call to a process. 
to the ministry of giving for the believers in Jerusalem, for I know how eager you are to help. Paul, Paul's kind of taking some shots at Corinth right here, because what happens, the church in Jerusalem had, 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 had hit some financial struggles. And so, so Corinth, when they were zeal, they were zealous, they were zealous, and they were like, listen, we're going to give some money to them to help them out, man. You know what I'm saying? We got them. So now Paul's about to send his boys there to collect the offering, the offering, the offering plate about to go around. And he has heard rumors that they're getting a little reluctant about it. Have you ever told somebody, yeah, I got you. Just let me know if you need some help. I got you. And then they'll be like, hey, yo, remember that time you said if I need some help? The time is now. You'll be like, I didn't. <clears throat> let me see. Then you start thinking about where well, there's other city resources that can help you with that issue. Yeah. Come on. So Paul's like, listen. He's like, when you read this language, you got to get into it. He, he was like, I know how eager you are to help. This is just like when you're talking to your child. I know you're so excited to eat your vegetables. <laughs> right? <laughs> and so you're trying to, trying to excite them because you're helping them do something that's going to be nutritious for them. Paul is trying to do something for them that's going to be nutritious for their soul. <laughs> See, they're so used to feeding their souls everywhere else. One person said Corinth is like the college campus. They are sexually perverted, spiritually divided, and socially despicable. <laughs> Corinth is like the church gone wild. I mean, they were nasty. They were greedy. They were selfish. They were haters, backbiting on each other. And so what Paul is doing, he's helping them go through the sanctification process of saying, don't let your soul be fed by everything else anymore. And so part of the instruction of them having a well soul is he's saying, listen, this is going to be nutritious for you. And look, and Paul even says, man, I've been boasting to the other churches. I've been boasting to Macedonia to, uh, about you. Like in Greece, like in Macedonia and Greece, they, they, they were ready to send an offering a year ago. In fact, it was your enthusiasm that stirred up many of the Macedonian believers to begin to give. The thing is, they hadn't gave yet, though. Let me, let me break it out like this. I got to hurry up, boy. Y'all, 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 I'm, right, I'm having a little fun here. Have you ever been about to do something that was a little dangerous, right? And the person who got you, who talked you into it, backed off at the last moment. Oh, yo, we should go, we should go jump off this ledge. No, nah, man. No, nah, it's going to be fun. It's 12 inches of snow down there. It's going to be fun. You should do it. And then you get up there, you're on the edge, and you're like, okay, here we go, here we go, here we go. And they're like, no, nah, dog, I ain't going to do it. <laughs> no, you did not get me. I got excited because you said you were going to do it. So Macedonia, they're like, we got excited because Corinth was going to do it. We already gave our money. And so Paul is saying, your mouth has written a check. <laughs> so... <laughs> You're going to eat your vegetables. <laughs> so that's what he's saying, right? And so he's saying this ministry of giving is going to be nutritious for you, for your soul. So let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul begins to brag about this Macedonian church. And when Paul brags about this Macedonian church, Macedonia was a small church. But, and, and, and let me just read what they were going through, and, but then see the outcome of what they were going through. It says, we want, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. We want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that was given to the churches of Macedonia. During a severe trial brought about by affliction, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty overflow in a wealth of generosity on their part. Y'all don't, hold, hold on, let me go back and read it, make sure. During a severe trial brought about by affliction, extreme poverty, they have the top three reasons why you shouldn't give. I'm going through something. I don't have that much. And people are hurting me. They were going through persecution in verse 2. But then this other part makes the equation different. Are y'all walking with me? It makes the equation different because it says in the midst of severe trial brought by affliction, their abundant joy. I get joy when I think about it. What is that? Their abundant joy. See, I'm trying to help you move from scarcity to abundance. They had abundant joy in a time that everything, their situation, circumstances, and resources said they should be scarce. 
Their abundant joy and then their extreme poverty overflow in a wealth of generosity. Whoa, 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 whoa. Extreme poverty overflowing to a wealth of generosity, it doesn't seem to line up unless they recognize something. Let's keep reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. In verse 3, he says, I can testify that according to their ability, their actual resources, and even beyond their ability, uh, even beyond their ability of their own accord, they begged us earnestly. Is that on the screen? Yes, they begged us earnestly. In the midst of trial, in the midst of affliction, in the midst of poverty, they begged us earnestly to give them something. No, 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 that ain't what it said. Most of us, we start begging when we don't have. <laughs> they beg us earnestly for the privilege of sharing. Y'all, this has been in your Bible the whole time. <laughs> they beg earnestly for the privilege of sharing in the ministry, the giving to the saints. And not just as we had hoped. Instead, they gave themselves first to the Lord. They weren't just philanthrop philanthropists that had money. They gave themselves first to the Lord, then to us by God's will. It's difficult to give God anything until you give him your heart. But once you give him your heart, you'll give him everything. And so what we find, most people don't give because of fear, scarcity, and selfishness. Let me break this down to you, the difference between the scarcity mindset and the abundant mindset. I talked about this a little bit last year, but I remember in March 2017, I was riding in my car, listening to a message series from Life Church. Craig Rochelle pastors it, and, and, and he talked about the scarcity mindset versus the abundance mindset. And one of his associate pastors preached one Sunday in the message, and literally I'm riding in my car, and they said, if you need prayer, concerning this subject, raise your hand. I was in my car like this. Because what they broke down to me was abundance was not about how much you have. Abundance was about maximizing what you have for the glory of God. And, but scarcity focuses on what you don't have. See, the scarcity mindset is marked by consumption. You get it, you're ready to eat it, you're ready to wear it, you're ready to spend it. You are spin, 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 spin. Eat, 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 eat. The scarcity mindset is marked by this. There is one pie, and if you are eating it, you're eating a piece of my pie. The scarcity mindset thinks there's not enough to go around. So every time you see somebody else getting blessed, you immediately think that that's your blessing. <laughs> see, and what I heard in the good Christian colloquialism, God got a blessing with your name on it. And with my name on it, you can't take it. Can't have my spot. <laughs> and so, <laughs> sorry, it was an inside joke. <laughs> Excuse me, this is very unprofessional. <laughs> and so when God has something for you, nobody else can take it. But the scarcity mindset says, if they get something good, that means it's less good for me. Help me. Listen, some of y'all are jealous over stuff you don't even want. God, this is crazy. You're jealous over a job that somebody else got that you didn't even want. You're jealous over stuff that they got just because it looks good on them and you're thinking that it's not enough good for me to get. Because scarcity is marked by comparison. See, it's not about how much you have, it's about how you how you use it, how you view it. It's a mindset. This is why you are transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, and here's the thing. Your heart and your harvest are directly connected to one another. You want to change your harvest, you got to change your heart. And moving from scarcity to abundance, it's not about changing your bank account. It's about changing your heart. I'm trying to help somebody, family. I am on a wrecking ball mission to break down the scarcity mindset because I was enslaved to it too long. I remember raising my hand crying and saying, God, forgive me for thinking that you weren't good enough for me. That you were only good enough to bless them, but you didn't have enough goodness to bless me. A misunderstanding of your finances and your money and God's blessing is a misunderstanding of God himself. And the last time I checked, my God owns a cattle on a thousand hills. The last time I checked, the earth is his footstool. The last time I checked, he has more than enough. And so, and so here's the thing, we, they, the reason why the church of Macedonia was able to move from this because they first gave God their 
hearts. And let me break it down to you like this. Here's the point. Money is a bad master but a good servant. Money is a terrible master but a good servant. Money was meant to be a servant. That's why I was called a ministry of giving. It was saying I'm serving with my money. The problem is, when you begin to serve your money, your money begins to have a God-like place. But it never has enough value to be able to fulfill the void that's in your heart. Money was never meant to be a master. Money was supposed to be a servant. And some of us are chasing a dollar bill all the time, and you're chasing your Have you ever thought that the, that, the, that the concept around identity theft normally messes with your money? Ooh, let that sit in. The reason why it normally messes with your money, because everybody knows that now people's identity is in their money. Jesus did not die and did not pay the bill with his blood so a dollar bill can buy you back. You are not a prostitute that can be purchased with earthly funds. He redeemed you from your prostitution of your soul. Come here, Hosea. He showed you that even while you prostituted yourself, he paid the price. He paid the price with something that the world cannot reproduce. <laughs> and so we find that money is a servant. And so when I look at this, I, I want to I give you this, the practical part here. When we look at money as a servant, I want to encourage you, be generous. Everybody say, be generous. I, everybody shout, abundance. Let's come on, say it again, Abundance. Say it one more time, abundance. abundance. Now say, that's my portion. That's my portion. When you get, you got to get this through your thick skull. That's what they would tell me. That when you recognize abundance is your portion, you recognize generosity is your opportunity to express the abundance you get a chance to experience. Because what you'll find is this is what, you, you should be generous. You should be generous to these things, okay, family? These things. You should be generous to anything that's about advancing the kingdom of God. This is practical. This is practical. It's trying to help you. Anything that's advancing the kingdom of God, sow a seed. Anything that will help the brothers and sisters in Christ, sow a seed. You should be generous to anything that's helping those that are in lack. This is the way of the word. When I recognize, when, when I look at the middle one, Sowing seed or being generous to brothers and sisters in Christ. I have been the recipient of somebody else who has given God their heart and is honoring him with their money. And then uh, the produce of them honoring God with their money blessed me. Last year about this time, about 12 months ago, I was stuck in this, I was stuck in this jam. Uh, life happens, man. Problems happen. Problems don't care what your name is. Problems don't care how much money you make, what your education background is. Problems don't care how, many, how much you pray. They're going to come. Amen. Uh, I'm sorry, got a little country attitude on you. And I remember the engine in our vehicle, in our main vehicle, it, 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 was, it had blown out. And I remember, and I, I wasn't sure what had happened. My, my wife was on the road in the middle of the night with both of my kids, and the, and the car broke down. And as a man, as a man, you don't want that. That messes with you. Because you want your family to be safe, right? So it's all, all, all these different levels. So here's the thing, I was stuck because the engine goes out, and then we still paying on the car. So I'm like, look, ah, ah! <laughs> I remember talking to the mechanic. I almost got mad at him, the one that picked it up. He over here using big words. I said, hey, sir, you had a, you know, the such and such vehicle, down and down with Chris Johnson, boom, boom, boom. And well, do you have an update on it? He said, man, it's catastrophic. I mean, I didn't, I didn't call you for all these syllables. It's catastrophic. What is it? Well, I'm not sure, man, but it looks like it looks like your engine is, 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 is done. It looks like, what is it? I didn't call you for a maybe. So anyway, the engine, the engine was blown, and, and so I remember the rubber, my knees turned into rubber, because I'm like, I'm stuck. I'm trying to save for this, trying to get out of debt here, trying to do this for my family, boom, 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 just, you know. And, and as I put down the phone, me and my wife, we talked, we prayed, and I shared a prayer request with somebody, and I shared a prayer request with a couple other people, and about five minutes later, somebody called me and said, listen, God has been so good to us, and we, it's been on me and my wife's heart to sow a seed to somebody. And I was wondering, would this amount help you? The amount they said was more than double than what I needed. And they said, is that okay with you? 
Yeah, 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 yeah. And said, what you, what you, he like, what you think? No, man, I'm trying not to cry. That's what I'm trying to think. Because I didn't, you know, we all reach different moments and what's a lot to somebody else might be a little to you and what's a little to you might be a lot to somebody else, right? And, and, and here it is, I'm in a vulnerable place, but somebody decided to honor God. And here's the thing, when I think about what the church of Macedonia did, family, I looked at the family that sowed the seed and what they were going through at the time, it was hellacious. They were going through an extreme trial, an extreme affliction, but they didn't look at their situation. They recognized money was a servant, money was a seed, but money was not the source. And they gave out of a place where they may have looked impoverished, but they gave out a place of overwhelming wealth and generosity. Family, money is a seed. See, when you recognize money is a seed, that's what Paul gets into in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. He's trying to help the Corinth believers recognize that money is a servant and it's a seed, but it's not the source. And in verse 6, he says, the point is this. The person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the person who sows generously will also reap generously. In other words, if you don't like your harvest, change your seed. Some of us are looking at the outcome. If you don't like it, change your seed. But he says, it's, it's the farmer's law. It's the law of reciprocity. You will reap what you will sow. Family, I want you to understand that biblical law. You will reap what you sow. One of the reasons why Oprah is filthy rich is because she gives away schools. She gives away stuff. You get a school, you get a school. Everybody gets a school. Like she... The law of reciprocity, it says you will reap what you will sow, even to the point in Galatians chapter 6 where it says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will reap in return. If you sow in the flesh, you're going to reap in the flesh. If you sow in the spirit, you're going to reap in the spirit. Everybody say sow. We've been taught to spin, 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 save, 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 save. but we have not been taught to sow, 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 sow. And I want to help you break through from the scarcity mindset. I want to help you break through from the North American idol called money. I want to help you understand when they say, in God we trust on, the, on that money, we want to say, in God we trust, and money, you are not God. Come on. And so here's the thing. When you talk about sowing and reaping, God says he loves a cheerful giver. And the thing about sowing and reaping is a process that can't always be seen. Because when you sow, you don't immediately see something back. And so what he's saying is trust the process. When you sow, something has to go into the ground unseen. And what happens when you're talking about sowing, the only way you can get excited about sowing is if you have an expectation of the harvest. Some of y'all haven't got excited about sowing to God because you haven't seen the harvest yet. Verse 8. And God is able... I need some church folk in here just to help the people that don't know the power of that statement. God is able. Let me help you. Come here, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. They were standing before Nebuchadnezzar. And he said, if you don't bow down and worship the gold, I'll throw you in the fiery furnace. And their response, our God is able. Family, I don't even care what comes after the statement. God is able. But let me tell you what comes after the statement. He's able to do exceedingly and abundantly. More than you can ask, think, or imagine. Verse 8. Let me keep going. I got excited. God is able. Somebody shout, he's able. Oh, I dare you to look at your bank account and say he's able. Pull out your phone and look at your bank app. He's able. The next time you get a bill, you don't like it, he's able. Yeah, okay. I'm trying to help y'all. And God is able, listen to these absolutes, to make, hey, put it on the side screens for me too. He's able. He's able. I want everybody to be able to see it. He's able to make, follow this family, every, listen to these absolutes, Every grace, grace, what you cannot earn, every grace, overflow. Everybody say overflow. <laughs> He's able to make every grace overflow to you so that in every way, all ways, having everything. Anybody getting excited? Everything you need, you may excel in every 
good work. As it is written, he distributed freely. He gave to the poor. So here's the thing. When you sow to God, you get a every blessing. Every way, all the time, in every aspect of your life, he's saying the harvest is there. Verse 10. Now the one who provides seed for the sower and bread for food will also provide and multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your righteousness. There's a level, there's a season of overflow, family. And when you sow right, you get ready for overflow. Tap your neighbor and tell them right now, get ready for overflow. Y'all are too bored in here. Look at somebody else. Tell them get ready for overflow. Because the concept of sowing a seed, you put the seed in the ground. And the seed always has more potential when it's put in the right place. The seed has more potential when it's not in your hand, but when it's in the earth. And when the seed produces, nobody looks at an apple tree and says, wow, look at that seed. There's a transition that happens in the ground. <laughs> because what happens, it, it gets into the biblical majesticness of creation. That in order for a seed to multiply, it must first die and then go to the earth. That's what Jesus said. So when Jesus was on the cross, he knew that he was setting them up to sow into the kingdom. See, money is not the servant. It's a servant. Because Jesus is the servant. He came to serve all of us, minister to us. Money is not the seed. It's a seed. Because Jesus is the seed of Abraham. Woo! He's the seed of David. But he's also the seed of salvation. In order for the seed to grow. It has to go into the ground, spend ample time there, be touched by divinity to produce something that comes out of it. They thought they buried Jesus, <laughs> but they planted him. They sowed Jesus into the earth and out of the earth began to produce a harvest of righteousness. So his gift to us, his indescribable gift is life and life more abundantly. Can somebody rejoice in the seed? Can somebody rejoice in the source that he's able? Ha. See, some of y'all still like, God, here it is. Here it is. Psalm 65, 11. Psalm 65, 11 says it like this. He has crowned the year with his goodness and his paths drip with abundance. Proverbs 3:10. If you honor the Lord with your finances, with your money, and the first fruits of your harvest, the promise says it's going to multiply. That's what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11. He will provide and multiply. Proverbs 3.10, it says when you honor him right, your bonds will be filled and your vats will overflow. He says your bonds will be filled and your vats will what? He will provide and multiply. Family, we're moving into a season of overflow. Malachi chapter 3. He says, come back unto me. Bring your tithe to the storehouse. Test me. Test me and watch. Won't I open up the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing? You won't have room to receive. Family, what I'm saying is, he'll press down whatever you give him. He'll shake it together. And it'll come back to you running over. Malachi chapter 3 again, again, again. I know you want to go home and eat your brunch, but let me bring you into a season of overflow. Malachi chapter 3, 10 says this. It says, I will open up the floodgates of heaven. The last time Israel I heard about floodgates opening up, it was, when, it was when God flooded the earth in Genesis chapter 6. So what he was saying was, I want to flood you. I want to overwhelm you with blessing. And if you trust me with the seed, I will multiply one plant, one water, but God brings the increase. I dare somebody in here to go ahead and give God a shout of praise on the expectation that he's going to multiply, he's going to provide, he's going to overflow. I 
of God will supply all our needs according to his riches and his glory. Let's shout unto the Lord.